everyone, and welcome back to The Geek Wave. This is the low-budget show. It's the show so low it has no budget. And maybe we'll get a budget one day, or we'll take out like $120 million of our own money, sell off part of the vineyard, and then just, you know, get the budget we need to make the proper thing that we've wanted to make for decades. The time that this this is coming out, it's Cannes weekend. I'm recording it through Cannes weekend. I'm very excited because I love movies. And I would love to go to con, but uh, there's no way they're going to ever let me go. I'm like a small time influencer. And if there's one thing that Cannes needs more than anything, it's more like people who say they're film critics, but not really film critics showing up to talk about movies and take pictures of screenings or complain when a Yergo Lanthanos movie has like three separate stories and people are like, why don't they just make a bunch of shorts then? God, it's 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 been a really interesting cons weekend or cans, cons, call it whatever you want. Nuts and bolts or whatever. Who cares? Because, like, man, there's so much going on there. Should we just jump right into the can stuff? I guess we could. I was going to, like, save it to the end here. But I'm just kind of, like, thinking about this weekend because of the time that I'm recording this currently, we just had the premiere of Horizon, an American saga, which is the huge big thing that Kevin Costner left Yellowstone to create. And that had him in a very good position. I think it's received well. I haven't read any of the reviews yet. I've just been looking at, like, the kind of general buzz and, like, the big standing ovation. Standing ovations mean nothing. They don't mean anything to anybody. But I guess we'll talk about cans for a minute here, just because it's kind of exciting. I love this stuff. I love movie stuff. I tried to go to Sundance this year. Couldn't get into Sundance. It was just too expensive. Self by Southwest was very recently, too. But the Cannes Film Festival, it's the big one. There's a lot of stuff that is premiering here. A lot of stuff... I don't know if I'll ever cover it, but there's been some cool things, some interesting things that are worth exploring, like that new, um, oh, what's it called? That new one, Rumors, with Kate Blanchett, that's like that weird comedy that premiered there. Like I said, Yurgos had his movie there. Paul Schrader had his new movie, O Canada, premiere there, which apparently is not that good. And he had some like weird questions. Someone was like, would you ever do Taxi Driver 2? And he's like, no, if we did it now, it'd be for money because it's stupid. And I respect that. But I don't know, it's kind of cool that Richard Gere has got like a weird movie coming out soon. It's been a minute since we have like a weird Richard Gere. Because he worked with Schrader a long time ago. Because he did American Gigolo, right? I believe that was Gear. So that's kind of exciting to see him come back. Director dealing with his own own mortality or whatever. Kinds of Kindness sounds like it's very interesting. It's like angry and aggressive, so that's kind of cool to see. There's a lot of other big movies and smaller movies that people liked or they didn't. Megalopolis uh, showed off there to mixed reviews, which is very exciting. (laughs) Very exciting. Very curious to see how that's going to go. I don't want to like talk about it too much, just because I think it's going to be incredible. Just an insane thing to experience. I hope I get to experience it in my lifetime. Is it going to get like a big release? It should. That'd be crazy. But I don't know. Should we look up some stuff from Cannes? I don't know. See if I can find anything just like randomly talking about stuff. Maybe there's a list of all the movies premiering. Let's see if anybody said anything else. Amelia Perez was a big one I heard people talking about too. And oh yeah, David Cronenberg's movie, The Shrouds. That's playing there too. I mean, that's awesome. I love Cronenberg. We haven't really talked about him much, but I like the movie that his son made too. Anora is playing? Is that is it playing? Oh my goodness. I'm so pumped for Anora. Sean Baker is a really cool director who's made like some really interesting stuff. Like Red Rocket is it's an insane movie that I just appreciate so much. And I really like the Florida Project. Anora looks so cool. That's going to be really fun. I hope that's good. So that was premiering there too. Uh, Andrea Arnold's movie Bird was actually getting a lot of big praise as well, which is very exciting to see. Are these all the films or just the ones in competition? It doesn't matter. There's a version of The Count of Monte Cristo that's going to be playing there. It's just, it's cool, man. It's like really exciting to see everything that's playing in this era and in this world right now. I believe the Ron Howard, Jim Henson documentary is also playing, which excites me because I'm a big fan of Jim Henson and I like Ron Howard. I just want Ron Howard to do some cool stuff again. 
But yeah, I think the big ones everyone's talking about is Megalopolis, Furiosa, Kinds of Kindness, O oh Canada, The Shrouds. Like those big ones of like directors that people are aware of. And I'm sure there too, random success. I don't know who's going to win. Who do we think is going to be like the Palme d'Or? Who's going to get the Palme d'Or? I don't really know. They're very weird about it sometimes. Have they given it out yet? Maybe I missed it. Maybe they did give it out. Either way, very curious to see how all this is going to go. But I like this stuff. Like, you know, Megalopolis is weird. Who would have thought? Who would have thought it's a weird movie? Who would have thought? That's kind of cool. Oh, Quentin Dupoe has a movie out there too, so that's kind of cool. Oh, is the new Paulo Sorrentino playing there too? Parthen, Parthenop, Par- Parthenope, something like that. Okay, I like his work. Okay, okay, okay. I like I I wasn't aware of all the movies that are playing there, so it's just I'm just looking at a list now, the list that Google has available. Who knows how accurate it is? That Nicolas Cage one is playing too, where he like uh, the surfer. What's that about? This is the same what it's about. Around a man who a man whose surfing plans are thwarted by menacing thugs and even more menacing wild animals. Oh my god. Okay. This sounds fucking awesome. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so Khan, Cans. What if movies were there? <laughs> Good movies. Or bad movies. Or just movies nonetheless. Kind of cool. <laughs> I cannot wait for Megalopolis. What a bizarre thing to exist in our lifetime. We need more stuff like that. We need more stuff that's just a director doing an insane thing. Because we don't get it enough anymore. But that's kind of cool. Uh, let's get into the actual news of the week. We don't have much. A lot of it is kind of just from like a big like conference or whatever that Amazon MGM had. Because that's what we are now. MGM, a legacy studio from Hollywood, is now owned by Amazon. And I think... Was it Sony that was going to buy Paramount or something? It's all terrible. Everything is terrible. But let's talk a little bit about the Amazon news that came out. We got a new trailer for Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. I didn't watch it. (laughs) Sauron looks like an elf now or something. It's like a new looking thing. It comes out in August and I'm like, I'll maybe watch it. But it's so weird that there is a Lord of the Rings television show that is coming out this year and nobody's really talking about it. Like, what happened to Lord of the Rings being the most important thing to ever live? I do not understand that. It sucks. And I don't think they're going to make a good movie with the search for Gollum. But that's where we are now. Oh, God. It's all shit, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe it'll be good. But I believe this is one of the shows that continued working during like the strikes where they went on without a showrunner for a bit. So I'm just not overly immensely happy about some of the stuff going on there. I guess we'll see. It can't be that good, right? Uh, I don't know. But there you go. Lord of the Rings. It's out. You can watch it soon, I guess. We're also getting a second season of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, which is the show starring Donald Glover and Maya Erskine. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how they look at it, they will not be returning for the second season. We're going to be following a new family. Okay, sure. I do think the success of this show does rest on the talents of Donald Glover and his brother doing a lot of like the writing and producing. I think taking the feel of Atlanta and moving it to something like this is what made the show work. If we do like a new season and make it an anthology for a new team, it might lose some of like the veneer that made it special. But whatever. They don't want to do it. That's their business. I'm not going to force anybody to do anything they don't want to. That'd be rude and stupid. So that's going on. Finally... After making a huge deal with Amazon like years ago, Phoebe Waller-Bridge will be making her first thing. That weird thing she was supposed to do with Tomb Raider is finally going to happen. She'll be producing, maybe writing, probably not starring in it. But, you know, there you go. Finally, Amazon will have another television series based on a video game. Do they have one outside of Fallout? I can't remember if they did one outside of Fallout. 
Is Fallout their only one? Feels like they should have had another one. I just can't remember. There's been so many. Paramount has the Halo one. HBO has The Last of Us. Are those the only ones? I I know they're not. There's probably more, right? God, I don't I don't know anymore. I feel like I'm forgetting all of these shows. All right, quick Google search video game TV shows. What do we got? And this this isn't helpful. You stupid list. None of this is helpful. This isn't helping me in any capacity. Thanks for doing. Well, this this is useless. You type that in on Google, they're not going to give you a list of anything. It doesn't matter. Let's just say the ones I said are the big ones that you need to talk about. The only good ones out there, probably. I don't know. Okay, there you go. So, yeah, we're going to get Tomb Raider, finally! Woo! Yeah, who's going to play Tomb Raider? Laura Croft, I mean. Who's going to play Laura Croft? Um, who would you get today to play Laura Croft, even? Like, I don't know if anybody will really want to do that role. Because we're also... I didn't put this in the news, but I'm just thinking about it now. We got, like, the first look at that new, like, Ro- Roland, Roman, Roland Emmerich. What's his name? The fucking guy that made all those movies. Roland Emmerich, is that his name? Oh, my God. Sorry about this. I've just been looking at canned stuff too much. He's got that new show coming out this year to Peacock. And it's like, what the hell is that show he's making? It's like the Roman Empire. It's like the history of Gladiator or whatever. And the truth is, it looks like shit. That new show he's making with Anthony Hopkins in it. And Those About to Die is the name. That's a terrible name, by the way. And, like, the pictures that they released for it, they look like shit. And, like, the backgrounds are so bad and the lighting is so bad. But God forbid anything looks good anymore. Oh, my goodness. Like, it looks like Rebel Moon. That's how shitty it looks. But I I bring it up because... That is the vibe I get from trying to attempt a Tomb Raider today. There's no way we're going to be doing a Tomb Raider show in real sets. Like, we're not going to go to, like, location for Tomb Raider. It's going to be, like, the volume with, like, a big rock in the middle or something. Like, there's, like, real right? Like, there's no way we're actually going to do something proper? Those about to die. I want to look this up a little bit more. It's crazy because I don't know if anybody wants Tomb Raider to come back. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm just looking at those about to die. What are we doing? (laughs) What are we doing? Are you telling me Roland Emmerich can't get a fucking movie made? He has to make this crap. This is insanity. Oh, man. But. That's not all the news we have to talk about from Amazon doing stupid stuff. (laughs) Because they're also, you know, Lord and Miller are kind of taking over, like, their branch of, like, Spider-Man, television, live action, whatever. And we have a couple pieces of news to come out from that. First one being that the Silk Spider Society show that they were developing, they're not doing that anymore. Sony, once again, learned, learned the wrong lesson. Because they saw Madam Web fail. They're like, oh, people don't want to see female Spider-Man characters. Just, you could do something so easy with Silk. You could do something so easy with Silk. She's in a bunker. She gets out of it. Yeah, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Is that the show where she was in the bunker? And you just mix that with a CW show. And you could just do that easily. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt meets Stargirl. There's your show for Silk. That'd be pretty freaking easy. I don't know. I don't know. I can't I can't with these people anymore. So we're not doing silk, but what we are doing <laughs> is these fucking Oh my goodness. We're doing the Spider-Man Noir show. Nicolas Cage will be back to play the character Spider-Man Noir, but it's not gonna be the same one he played in animation. This is a live action show. And because nobody is allowed to do Spider-Man in live action or the Peter Parker character in live action. He will not be playing Peter Parker, nor will he be wearing the suit, probably. He'll probably be wearing black clothes with a turtleneck and a trench coat and talk about how he used to be a superhero. Which, look, I have said this before about the Spider-Man Noir show. If this is what it takes to give me a hard-boiled detective show 
with some vague superhero fun, I'll take it. I have no connection to the Spider-Man Noir character, aside from I think the co- the costume looks really cool. So if that's, this is what it takes, if this is what it takes to have that happen, I can put up with it. I'm not going to lose sleep over this. I don't think anyone's going to be mad that they can't have a proper Spider-Man Noir. That character is not super popular like that. And even so, it's not like they're going to use like characters from the history of Spider-Man. I guess they can, though, because that's one of the things of Sony is like, they can use the adjacent characters. But this, I don't know. Like, if we do a straight-up, like, this is a noir story with Nicolas Cage, who has some insane energy, he has some vague spider-related powers, maybe gonna fight, like, a mobster Norman Osborn or something, then I'm interested in that. I can put up with that. I would love it if the whole time we just vaguely reference that his name's Pete or something, And he just uses like an alias because he's undercover because his identity was destroyed or something. That'd be pretty cool. But this is what it takes. Look, we just had Monsieur Spade and Sugar, two shows I really like. So I'm always down for some more noir detective stuff. So whatever form that takes, I'll accept it. If this is what it takes to have that made in like the Marvel adjacent umbrella, I can live with this crap. Do I think it's going to be good? Probably not. I have no confidence in anybody involved in Sony at the moment. But hey... You never know. Anything could be good, but most things are bad. That's all the Amazon news we have. But there's one other thing I want to talk about, just because it's kind of interesting to me. I just briefly want to talk about the new movie that Ella Purnell is going to be starring in, just because I think her career is about to take off in some big ways. I look at this, and you know what? I was thinking about this the other day, because last week we talked about Edgar Wright. Yes, I'm bringing it up again. We're talking about Edgar Wright possibly directing the Barbarella movie. I was thinking about this, too. Ella Purnell looks a little bit more like Jane Fonda, and I also think she's got like some fun, flirty energy that's more interesting than the stuff Sydney could potentially show us i'm not against the sydney sweeney casting i think she's fine i don't know i just think ella purnell i'm just i'm picturing like my dream project now it'd be ella purnell with a wachowski directing a barbarella movie and that's kind of where i'm at either way she she reminds me of like a classic starlet who's having a lot of fun she's working on like a horror comedy movie called the scurry which is going to be filming in the uk very soon it's like what if there's like killer squirrels that attacked people? I just thought it'd be interesting to bring up where it's like, yeah, this is the kind of thing you'd want from somebody who's having fun of their career. She has a big break on Fallout. Now she joins like Craig Roberts' weird comedy horror movie about squirrels that are deadly. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I'm starting to like this girl's career. I think it's going to be really fun. I don't know. Everything's kind of bad. I'm so, so worried. So worried. For that Barbarella movie. And we don't have to talk about it here again. <laughs> because I, I will probably... I'll, I'll talk about it forever, but no. Cool. Good for you. Do a horror comedy where you fight squirrels or whatever. You have the energy to pull that off. You could be our modern day Elvira type if we were to put you in the right seat. Like, there are few young actresses where I look at today where I think we could take them plop them onto like that red velvet couch and have them talk about how sexy they are in a way that's funny when you talk about movies there are a few that think could do it i think the girls from riverdale could do it and i think ella purnell could do it those are like the only ones i'm thinking at the moment so that's kind of fun but let's take a quick break and when we come back let's talk about the reason you're probably here x-men 97 All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to talk X-Men 97, the most recent entry into the MCU, question mark. It's not. It's not in the MCU. It's in its own continuity, which is also in an old continuity that you're probably too young to have been around to watch. I know I was. Hey, it's fun to talk about stuff from before our times. Nostalgia is always something we're weaponizing to get you to like something. But sometimes... It's good. Sometimes it's good to remember stuff that you liked when you were a kid and enjoy it again. I've been rewatching the 2003 Ninja Turtles. Makes me happy. I liked it then. I like it now. It's strong and interesting and fun. So I have no problem 
well, I shouldn't say I have no problem doing something nostalgia baity. I don't like it most of the time because it's rarely ever good. Most of the time it's pretty bad and boring. But you know what? This one worked. <laughs> so this project was teased years ago. Kind of during like the second wave of the Disney Plus announcement. They had like the initial wave of what was coming. And then they're like, here's the other stuff. And then they're like, here's all the stuff coming out very soon. And they announced a couple of animated projects from that. We knew we were going to get a few seasons of What If. We were aware of that already. But this came with the announcement of the Marvel Zombies television series and the Spider-Man Freshman Year. The time that was going to happen, it was called Freshman Year. It has now been changed to Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man and is probably going to be separate from this and everything else connected to it. Because they don't know what they're doing and nothing ever makes sense anymore. <laughs> so we're changing things up, which is fine. You should try new things and whatnot. We have not seen the Spider-Man cartoon, nor have we seen the Marvel Zombies cartoon. But we have seen two seasons of What If. And I will safely say, this show is better than both of those. So X-Men 97. The show is announced. It is going to be a continuation of the original 90s X-Men cartoon. Now, that was before my time. I've said it before. I'm born in the late 90s, but I'm born in the 90s nonetheless. So I was culturally aware of this my whole life. I was just a little too late for like the Marvel sweep of animation that happened in the 90s where we got Iron Man and Silver Surfer and we got Fantastic Four for a minute or was that later? We had that Spider-Man show. And of course we had X-Men. And in that time period, X-Men was the strongest thing Marvel had going for them. Like, it's hard to think about. But X-Men was really big in the 90s. It was the biggest thing ever. Like, the most selling comic book of all time was X-Men. It's crazy. They had a cartoon that people loved. It launched a toy line from Toy Biz that people loved. And they collect. I have some of those original Toy Biz X-Men figures. I got a Nightcrawler. I think I have two Nightcrawlers, actually. And I have a Juggernaut. Like, I have those. I'm aware of how big that was. And then, you know, Marvel hit some problems as the 2000s went on. They sold some stuff to Fox. Fox made some bad movies. And now we're in a time where Marvel Studios is owned by Disney. They have a streaming service, so they want to make some new content. And, you know, reintegrate the X-Men back into their staying power. And, and become the cultural phenomenon that they used to be, or whatever. And what's easier to do? Do you cast a bunch of new actors in the role of the X-Men, spend hundreds of millions of dollars to make it right, or do you reboot the show that you know successful from the 90s? I think it's easier to reboot the 90s show, and I have, I'm have i not against that. Again, I never watched all of the show. I'm aware of it. I know key episodes. I know the key players from the show. And I am virtually aware of the history of X-Men. But again, that's my job. <laughs> you know, I do this. I know X-Men. But they are not my team. And I've talked about this before, too. The X-Men have never been my team. I think it's because when I was a young boy watching all of these pre-MCU Marvel movies, the ones I gravitated to were the Hulk, Daredevil, and Ghost Rider. A guy dealing with Catholic guilt, the literal demon <laughs> that's on fire, and a rage machine. And I liked all of those characters. And I wasn't against any of the stuff we saw in the X-Men movies. When I was a kid, they were just fine over there doing their thing. I was never big into Spider-Man, and I was never big into the X-Men. And as I grew up, it was the Fantastic Four, it was the Avengers... And again, it wasn't Spider-Man or the X-Men. The two biggest franchises they had, arguably, <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. I just never really connected with those worlds. But then, I just remember all the good stuff about X-Men. Because this show's coming out, and I'm like, man, X-Men is kind of good. And 
that's just because for so long my cultural interpretation of the X-Men was just these crappy Fox movies that didn't make the characters act like the characters, didn't have any of like the nuance that they wanted to for the stories, and just fell flat. So when I got to see like a good interpretation in the comic books, of course I did that, but then in X-Men 97 I was like, oh yeah, I guess I do like the X-Men, I've just never really delved into them just because there's so much. But it's just exciting to have good stuff. And that's the thing about this show. I went into this show thinking, this is not going to be for me. I have no connection to the X-Men. I don't like that cartoon enough to want to see a sequel to it. But I I really fucking enjoyed it. <laughs> I think it's a really good show. A really good cartoon. One of the stronger cartoons that Disney Plus has put out for like an adult animated whatever. It's really well handled. And it does all the things that has been mixed. It's done all the things that's been missing from X-Men adaptations for a very long time. Which is, it feels like a team. People feel like they want to be involved in this. And we're going to have actual references to the comic books that feel earned. And turn it into a melodrama <laughs> in like a realistic way. And that's really cool to experience because you needed that. Like, this is the X-Men. They're melodrama. They're soap opera. They are going to deal with some random shit all the time. And this show handles that perfectly. So I'm genuinely impressed. What didn't impress me, and this just goes back to, like, the target audience thing, was the marketing push of the VHS nostalgia retro nature to it. That does nothing for me. That, that means nothing to me. When they put out those posters where it's like, here's all the classic VHS copies of X-Men, I'm like, this is great. Like, the 40-year-olds who grew up watching this, I'm sure they're going to love this. It's going to be so good for them. But for me, it does nothing, and it means nothing to me. But I guess that's the audience you want to, like, capture with this show? Is the older audience? I don't know, like, the demographics for this show but i'd have to imagine the audience skews older it's it's a mature show that has mature themes a lot of talking and that's kind of what i like but at the same time i just don't know if like a young person really has the love for this style of x-men i think they would i think they would because the x-men are universal characters it's just interesting to think about I do think the target demographic was skewing for that older market because nostalgia is so big and we don't really have any other animated shows going on right now. This kicks off a new branch of Marvel Studios, which is Marvel Animation. And essentially what this does is gives them an excuse to do the other shows they're going to do later. Look, this is all... Uh, look, okay. Aside from this being... Marvel Studios taking the X-Men from, like, Fox and doing, like, their first real thing with it. This marks a, a reintroduction to the classic X-Men world for audiences. It also is just, like, you know, could we test the wires to see if we could bring back some of those other classic 90s animations? The ones that people hold so dearly in their hearts. The ones that Hasbro has been making Marvel Legends action figures of for a while in, like, the classic nostalgic packaging. Could we just do those? Hmm? Could we do a sequel to the Spider-Man show? Or the Iron Man show that sets up Force Works or an Avenger show? Could we bring the Fantastic Four in here? Could we do that kind of stuff? No doubt that's what they're thinking. And that's okay. Again, you're playing into a generation that grew up with that stuff. They hate the world around them. They want the nostalgic stuff that they remember from the 90s. So, yeah, I can't be mad. I don't love it. I don't love that a lot of the marketing and way this exists is relying on the classic animation. But I can't be too mad at it if it's working and is a good product. This is a good show. One of my favorite shows to come out this year, which is crazy considering I went into this expecting nothing. I didn't watch any of like the actual like trailers or clips for it because like, it, it, it means nothing to me. I don't care about the extended world of the X-Men the way I care about, like, the nonsensical bullshit that the Avengers go through in every issue. Or the way that Power Man and Iron Fist do in every issue. Like, I just don't connect to it like that. But then, 
the show comes out and the first episode i'm like okay i see what we're doing here i'm kind of having some fun with it i like these characters i like the way they look i like the way we're handling things we're just jumping right into it again we're establishing the threat of you know trask and guy rich and all that stuff and just kind of like setting up a couple of the things i'm like okay this is a pretty good first episode they're teasing the stuff with magneto i'm really liking that and then they do like a trial of magneto episode and i'm like okay i'm I'm really liking this. And then they do an Inferno episode. And I'm like, okay, I'm really liking this. And then they do like life death in two parts. And I'm like, okay, I'm really liking this. And they do a Genosha episode. I'm like, I'm really liking this. And they go to space. <laughs> and we see Lelantra and Deathbird. I'm like, okay. I'm really liking this. And then we get like an intense finale that's in three parts. And I'm like, okay, I really like this. This is impressive. And it's the kind of thing that makes me so happy that the movies will never be able to do, which is just having references feel like real references and actually look like something I like, feel like something I like copy scenes from a comic book that I like, use characters that I like, do something I like. It's the reason I love an adaptation of a comic book in a cartoon form, especially like the serialized stuff from Marvel and DC. We can make it look just different and have specific looks for the characters, introduce side villains that we don't always use all the time, just have people show up. It's not like a movie where we have to make things look modern and militaristic and all that shit. We can just have all of your characters wear their classic outfits. Hell, half of them change outfits throughout the show to wear even more classic outfits. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. And the clear love for like the Claremont era stuff, I'm like, yes, that's awesome. That's the stuff I like too. And it's actually about something. And it's, it's, it's so surprising because I've just been so used to the X-Men not being treated like this, except in the comic books. In the comic books... They've been going through some shit recently. We're like nearing the end of the Kokoa era. But now we're kind of entering from the ashes, so that's its own thing. But just like having X-Men on television that feels like classic X-Men, the characters look like classic X-Men from the comic books. We're doing the stuff with Aurora and Forge. And I'm like, wow, this feels really good and looks interesting and is actually well handled and documented and handled perfectly now showrunner Bo DeMeo he's been very vocal about a lot of the stuff in the show he was also let go from season two and season three so he's not going to be the showrunner anymore there is still some secrecy around what that could be and I don't want to dwell on that too much if you're going to be fired for a show this successful there's probably some stuff behind the scenes we don't know about so I don't want to be in defense or support of him too bad without knowing the full story because I don't know what it is. But what I find very interesting is he is an openly gay man who partied and says he has been to the nightclub Pulse. If you remember years ago now, there was a shooting at Pulse and a lot of people died. And he said, because there was an episode that came out that kind of like depicted the genocide of the mutants on Genosha. His inspiration for that was like being in a safe place where you could be accepted for your differences is suddenly attacked by people that hate you and how that experience at Pulse, like his local nightclub and his local bar affected how he went into the X-Men. And I hear something like that. That makes sense to me. I'm like, th that that's going to get you the job because you clearly understand how to handle these characters. I love that aspect of the show. This entire season is a, not about the superhero team, the X-Men. It's about a reaction to a world trying to accept the X-Men because they've been lied to by either Charles Xavier or Scott Summers or Magneto. Everyone's kind of lying to them, so they want the world to accept them, but they have to hide certain aspects of themselves. And that just turns into like the melodrama of just a family that's broken and people who aren't happy with themselves. What does it mean to be normal? What does it mean to accept yourself? What are you fighting for? Like, that's the stuff that X Men should be. You are a marginalized group that is against the general public and government, and every action that's taken against you could either be, you know, genocide 
or stopping a mad supervillain. That's why Magneto is an interesting villain. That's why Charles Xavier is an interesting character. That is why we love seeing the different dynamics between all the characters and stuff. I really like how they handle the use of the president in the show. He wants to be in support of the X-Men, but the world is kind of turning against him. They try to do that same feeling with Captain America when he appears. It doesn't work as well as it does with like the president going against stuff. It handles the whole mature aspect of the X-Men really well. The homophobia, the xenophobia, the things that are different than you being scary and you have to destroy it. It handles all of that well. And it also just adapts comic book stories really well. Like, do you ever think we're going to see Madeline Pryor do the Inferno stuff in live action? And have that be like a resounding thing throughout the whole season where Scott thinks he loved one woman, but he actually loved another one, but they're the same woman and he doesn't know how to handle any situation. And it like wrecks his relationship with both Madeline and Jean because of it. I'm like, that is something we don't see. We're never going to have that handled perfectly. Do you think we're going to have like some weird interpretation of the Wolverine and Morph relationship handled in live action? There's no way they'd let it be that androgynous and ambiguous. They just wouldn't do it. The movies are never going to have the Kakoa stuff of everyone's fucking everybody. But this animated show, everyone's dressed like a little weirdo. Rogue's hooking up with like an older man. And she's hooking up with Gambit. Everyone looks hot. Everyone's horny for each other. It's kind of great. And I'm like, that's the stuff I like to see. I really like how they handled everybody. I don't think there's a single character that they've mishandled here. I cannot say that about every adaptation. The last Marvel one where I really believe they handled every character right is Avengers Earth Mightiest Heroes, where I'm like, this is how you'd handle all of these characters and some of their best interpretations of those characters. But I like it. You know, standouts to me are just seeing a really good adaptation of Scott Summers, which is not something we get a lot of. A really good adaptation of Storm and Forge. That relationship, I love so much. Probably some of my favorite stuff in the show is the life-death stuff with Storm and Forge. I love that. A very good Magneto. I'd argue the only character to come out of the Fox era unscathed is the stuff of Magneto. He's handled perfectly. And even Rogue is handled so well. And Nightcrawler is handled well. And they don't have Wolverine front and center, which is just perfect because that just shows you people like these characters more than they like Wolverine. And I'm like, that should be the case. He's really good as like the supporting older brother or dumb uncle. And that's how we should treat him. But you just love to see that. And we have good Cable and good Bishop and good Madeline and Jean and good Lalandra. And I'm like, what? How is any of this happening? Why is this all working? It's crazy. Because I'm just so used to like these adaptations fucking over these characters. But it's crazy when we could do it justice. It's, it's kind of great. I don't know. Like it's so surprising to me that sometimes we can just have it work like this. And have all of it make sense. And I, I just like, like the flow of the entire show, which is just kind of like revealing who the big bad is. It's Bastion at the end. And you're like, that's really cool because that's not like where your mind would immediately go to. You'd think it'd be different than that. But he is, he is a villain because he's kind of rejected by both mutants and humanity. And he's like, this is the only way to make them learn who we are and understand what we can do. So he makes all of his evil master mold and sentinel stuff go against humanity and kind of like pose it as like the X-Men have been lied to and are being li or are lying to you as well. It's Theo James. I think that's who Bastion is. And I'm like, that's really cool because that's giving you a new actor in a new role doing something incredibly fun. And it just works. But even just like taking away the big stuff where like these evil sentinel creatures are going to destroy the world it's just about magneto learning to accept the future charles wants them to have and charles learning to accept the future magneto sees and i'm like that is at its core just two boyfriends bickering at each other and i love to see that like that is what this should be <laughs> it just handles that so well i'm i'm blown away by how they handle Magneto in this show. I love Magneto. I would argue 
one of the best things that Marvel has created is Magneto. Because there is so much you could do with that character. And the further away you get from his origin story, the more poignant and interesting it can become if you let it exist in that way. You just love to see that. And they let him go into so many different directions, being the hero, being the villain, being like the ruler of Genosha. Like, it's crazy that some of the best stuff is just him comforting a child who's scared he's going to die after their home is invaded. I'm like, that is just perfect for the Magneto character. That is some really good stuff to show for him. And to have like the Boy Scout su- and to have like the Boy Scout Scott Summers just realize there's more to life than what he's been told and he's got to like figure out who he's going to become. It's very interesting. It's interesting. They handled this so well in the animation. I think it looks pretty good. I haven't had any issues with it. Sometimes it, it, it's got like the rotoscope thing going a little too much. I'm like, I don't, I don't know about this. But it's clean. It's crisp. It looks better than what if. And I think it, I, I 100% think they want to spin this off into 100 different directions for 100 different other cartoons because they showed us a bunch of characters. Spider-Man, Captain America, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Cloak and Dagger, Daredevil, Freaking Winter Guard was in there for a minute. Silver Samurai was in there for a minute. I think X Factor or like Alpha Flight even showed up. They wanted to give you a bunch of stuff. And I don't know. I feel like just referencing stuff in a cartoon is more interesting than doing it in live action. Just because I I feel like there's better intention in there. As opposed to just doing it in the movies. I don't know. But it's crazy that we did all this stuff. It's mature. It relies on nostalgia in its marketing, but the show itself is about pushing forward to a new era, almost like the Grant Morrison era in some cases of X-Men stuff. And I think that's very interesting, and it's not something I was expecting from this. But then again, I didn't know what I was expecting from this show because it could have been anything. And it surprised me at every turn doing so many different and unique things. So I got to commend it. for Somehow... X-Men is one of my favorite things Marvel Studios has produced in a while. And I think that's weird. (laughs) Because I just didn't expect it. I didn't expect them to have the patience to make something this interesting or unique. And I feel like the wrong trend that people are going to learn is trying to adapt this again. And that's why I really like James Gunn's comment that they're not going to try this. Like, it works because it's its own standalone thing. Trying to do something like that is just chasing the clout, and we don't want to do that. But it's kind of cool. I feel like this could be like the first series to like usher in a new era of like superhero animated stuff because we have the new season of My Adventures of Superman coming out very soon. We have Batman Cape Crusader coming out in August. That Spider Man cartoon is supposedly coming out still. We could be seeing a resurgence of stuff happening. I hope that's the case because it could be kind of fun have some good stuff come out but i just like the x-men being good and doing x-men stories in an x-men cartoon i didn't think we'd ever see it again <laughs> it's just kind of impressive i genuinely liked it i was genuinely like i have a lot of fucking television i watch i have a whole list going and when this show was coming out i had like the bad batch and Pomerel and sugar and the sympathizer and acapulco and stuff and this just took precedent This was like, I want to watch this first because it's good and it's going to be interesting to see and it's going to give me a new appreciation for the comic books I love and have me actually want to go back and read X-Men stuff, which is something I like when it comes to the X-Men, I know more than most people. I am by no means an expert on X-Men history, but I know so much of it, but I might go back and read some key stuff now. Maybe. It's just, it's crazy. Like, they did so much right. They did so much right. It's unbelievable. So, X-Men 97, I'm going to give a 9 out of 10. I genuinely think this show held together in ways I wasn't expecting based on the marketing and the way it wanted to present itself. So, I think that's kind of impressive. And I'm glad this show exists because it is genuinely interesting. And if we get that... Like, I don't know if they'll do, like, a reboot of, like, the 90s Spider-Man show, but we did see the final episode of this one. 
he has Mary Jane back, and if I'm not mistaken, I never watched the Spider-Man one. I believe that ended without him going to search for Mary Jane, so maybe some bullshit's going to come up from there. I don't know. But there you go, X-Men 97. The best thing Marvel's made in a while. A while. Well, since She-Hulk. <laughs> She-Hulk's amazing. Anyways, thank you all for watching this episode of The Geek Wave. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And of course, I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck. Da-na-na-na-na-na-na.